Our next guest has a passion for geology, and she has discovered that there is a profound link with two of her other passions, food and wine. Yeah. She is sought after for her understanding of how the soil and the rocks influence what we eat and drink. And she has become enthusiastic about how the unique geology of British Columbia can be one of our greatest assets. She has trained a staggering number of sommeliers in Vancouver and across North America. Please welcome DJ Kearney. Rocks. I have rocks. And I have glasses, too. Um, Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sam. It's so exciting to be here. I can't see any of you. It's true about the theater lights. Um, my name is DJ, and I drink for a living. I also eat and write and travel and teach. I have a really satisfying career, and it is one when I get my, remember, like Heather, to do my pictures. There we go. I'm that little monkey under the yellow or the pink, the pink arrow. And I work in the wine business and I am so privileged to do this. I'm so lucky. I get to travel. I've been to all corners of the wine world. I've met amazing people. I've learned about cultures and traditions and history through wine. It's been quite remarkable. It's something I never, ever planned. I didn't know when I was this age that, that this is where I would end up. Um, wine is hard. It's a very big subject. It's ever-changing. It really takes the 10,000 hours, and I would actually say the 20,000 hours in wine before you know a thing or two. So I didn't know this was ahead for me, and maybe my parents uh, suspected it. That's my glam-looking mother, um, artist, psychotherapist, and the guy is my dad. He usually sports a really big, scruffy, rugby-style beard, but he's very clean-shaven. Um, he was a, a professor of geophysics at McMaster University when this picture was taken, and we'd just come over from England. Um, I, of course, doted on my dad. Every summer, he would pack us up. We would borrow the ex-army stinky, moldering tents from the geology department at McMaster, and we would go camping, and we would go rock hounding as well. We had family trips that took us to the Canadian Shield, to the Burgess Shale, to the Appalachian Mountains in the, in the US, and I would just be at his side. We were camping, we were holidaying, but we would find rocks along the way. I learned to identify rocks, I smelled them, I licked them, I, co I collected them. I was a rock nerd kid, if ever there was one. Um, I have some rocks with me. I have one that is really special and is special to my dad. This is called a rhyolite dummy. It's from Hungary. Do you hear that? It's got little, little bits of rock inside it. So this came out of the Carpathian Mountains in huge volcanic ex explosions. It was liquid, and then as it cooled, it encased other little rocks, and we call it a rhyolite dummy, and they're actually very rare. So when I found this one in the Tokai region, it was really exciting. This is a fossilized oyster shell from the Chianti region in Tuscany. No more oyster. Um, a, a, piece, a, a piece of chalk from uh, Australia, from the Adelaide Hills. A piece, Sam mentioned BC, and I have an amazing piece of schist here uh, from the South Okanagan. We have very old and very important and special geology. And this is a rock from Austria. And Jason Yamasaki, one of my star students, BC Sommelier of the Year in 2014, gave this to me when he came back from Austria. Um, so I treasure it. I treasure all these rocks. I also treasured the moments when I was studying, when I found my dad's research papers and his PhD footnoted. When I was a kid, I could say words like dodecahedral and sililmanite and kyanite. I understood plate tectonics. I was lucky. I was lucky. And what's even luckier 
is that rocks and geology are such an important part of wine. It's really, you know, it, it's all important. Grapevines grow in a rocky environment, and great wines can transmit that environment through them. So the next picture is about my mum. Um, she was English and therefore a wretched and disinterested cook. I feared meal times. They were wretched and, and, and miserable, and I threw up most of the time. I was a very, very fussy eater, <laughs> which is a shame, but it, that's, that's the way it was. Her bangers and mash weren't bad at all. Um, but I had a meal when I was 12 years old that changed everything. My dad took me for Greek food. Uh, he was a professor in, in Ontario, in Toronto at that time, and we had some some food on the Danforth, and it was just like this, lamb and those gorgeous lemon potatoes and vegetables, and I discovered for the first time that food could taste, <laughs> and that it could taste good, really, really good, and I wanted more, so I had to do it myself, and I went, I taught myself how to cook, I went to the library, I took out cookbooks, and bit by bit, I started to take over the family meals. My mom loved it. She was never happier. My first job as a 13-year-old was cooking scones for a restaurant. And every weekend, I would cook 12 dozen scones for a local restaurant. Um, I eventually went to culinary school. Uh, this was a deep need inside me that I recognized. So I filled in the gaps in my knowledge. I learned how to cook professionally, and I did that for a while. But Along the way, as one does in the food business, I discovered wine. I'd been drinking a long time, stealing sherry from my parents and things like that. But I had this wine. Um, it was from Spain, the region of, of Rioja, a beautiful producer, and it was an old, old bottle. And I tasted that wine, and I just stopped dead in my tracks. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. It gave me goosebumps. It made me laugh. It made me cry. And it made me think, how can wine do this? How can wine evoke so much emotion, pull out so much feeling from a liquid, from fermented grape juice? Well, I had to find out, so I went back to school and learned to study more, and I did every program that was possible. Um, a long time ago, I got my sommelier diploma, my WSET level four. Um, I enrolled in the Master of Wine program. And then after, in the middle of those 10,000 hours, I uh, started to teach. And I learned I love to teach more than anything else. And I've taught thousands of students, as Sam said, which has been very, very gratifying. Putting the rock knowledge, the food knowledge, um, and the 10,000 hours together. Sports is a huge focus in my life. That's why I don't look like the diagram that uh, Diane mentioned. Uh, you gotta offset the wreckage of this industry. Um, so I got my black belt when I was 35. Yes, I'm a late bloomer. This was a special race, that 100th anniversary of the Boston Marathon. Um, I had kids along the way. I uh, brought a couple of wine drinkers into the world, my twins, Sean and Alex, and they're 17 in this picture, so that is not wine in their glasses at all. It's apple juice, I'm pretty sure of it. Um, along the way, I started working at Vancouver Magazine, where I was lucky enough to be the drink editor, a judge, and then the, um, the chief judge of the wonderful wine competition that I love so much. And now I hang my hat at a very special place called New District. And again, this is where my entire career comes together, um, where I help people be unfussy and unfearful about wine. It's an online wine store. It's a website where you can cruise around and choose things that help you learn as well. Wine has a weird intimidation factor that's not part of any other industry. You're not fearful when you choose your Tide or your Nespresso pods, but with wine, it's very different. So let's relax about wine. Um, I've given you a little coupon for 15% off for this website in your program. Use it or not, but let's, um, let's be unfearful and unfussy about wine. And thank you so much for your time. <laughs>